Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of UMass Sports Weekly. I'm your host, Casey Johnson. Great show lined up for you tonight. A lot of highlights, a lot of stuff that you won't get anywhere else. First off, we're going to recap basketball's past week. Some good games, some really bad games, and we'll also preview the VCU game on Friday. A lot to talk about there. We'll also follow that up with men's lacrosse, check in on how they're starting their season off. Then Adamo Pull Zone will have you with the Boston Sports Desk. Well, not Boston, all sports. And then we'll finish it up with UMass Hockey. And also look for a James Ahedebo interview today. This is UMass Sports Weekly. This is UMass Sports Weekly. Welcome to UMass Sports Weekly. Now joining me at the table to discuss some UMass basketball, Mark the Shark Daly and Mark Jean Louis. You are familiar with them. They are Mark E. Mark. Guys, welcome to the show. Let's start it off right for him. Now, some ups and downs in this past week of UMass basketball. We saw a solid win at George Washington. Good win for the boys there as George Washington had a really solid record, actually the same record as us yeah. going into the game. And then we had a really tough loss, first loss at home of the year to George Mason, who we just haven't played well against this year now. Mark, why don't you take us over the George Mason game? Really rough. Had it at home, though, so we got some coverage of that, some highlights of that. But just a really tough loss for the guys that, you know, uh, it was just really disappointing to watch. But what happened in that game? I mean, absolutely. I think I actually said this last week in our last show that they had to shut down the guards Brian Allen and Sherrod Wright in order to have a chance in this game but they just couldn't absolutely and as we go to the highlights over here you'll see as we watch the highlights over here Sherrod Wright just absolutely went off over here yep here you go there's a three-point shot from downtown it looks like there's no one guarding him on that one and then again just another open look I believe that one was from Sherrod Wright again and then again off a fast break Horrible defense over there, and again, another easy two points against Sherrod Allen. I mean, sorry, Sherrod Wright for that matter. Another bucket over there, and then again, you see same, you have same theme over here, and again, he just makes it look easy, and that's how, I mean, absolutely. Just going from the start of the game, what they had to do was they had to shut down Brian Allen and Sherrod Wright to start of this game. They mm -hmm. just could not do that. I mean, Brad, Brian Allen, he had uh, 15 points in this game, Sherrod Wright had 22 points in this game, and just almost from the get-go, I mean, GMU got off to a 10-5 lead, and from there, the UMass had to play catch-up. They just could not get back to the game. I mean, just going across the board, um, GMU, they shot 47% from the field, and this is a team that does not score a, a ton of points in the Atlantic 10 Conference. Mm -hmm. UMass could only shoot 39% from the field. And then from the free-throw line, UMass, again, not really a whole lot of impressive, impressive shots only there. They, they missed 11 free-throws in the game and shot 63%. While GMU, they were able to shoot better than 75%. So again, a whole bunch of opportunities in this game, but UMass just failed to capitalize, and GMU just was able to take away from it early and take control. Yeah, that seems to really have been just the talk of everyone around, especially around here in the studio, is free throws. They have been just poor on free throws this entire season. And that stuff, you know, they talk about being a tourney team, and free throws become huge in the tournament. Every point matters, and if... You're going out there shooting 40%, 50% Can't the cut free, it. It's, it's, it's not going to cut it. And no. That's something they need to change. Hopefully we'll see it in uh, upcoming games. But, yeah, it's, it, that, that has definitely been a problem that we've been seeing with them. And we remember early in the year they really struggled with George Mason before at George Mason. Really deserved to lose the game and brought it down to the very end and won. Yep. But mm -hmm. uh, just not good performances. I don't know if it's something with George Mason, but not great performances. But a good performance we did see in the game at George Washington. Minutemen won that game 67-61. Good way to bounce back. Mark, why don't you give us a little recap of that game? Well, I mean, definitely um, it was a must win after a terrible loss to George Mason. A team that was going into the game was 8-15 and overall, 1-9 um, one in, uh, one in, in the A-10 going into that game. So that we really needed a win, and we came through and got it. And I think the biggest thing, to, that, the biggest reason we did win that was because we were focused. Going into the George Mason game, anyone that was at the game happened to be there early. They definitely saw that UMass was not focused. Uh, in warm-ups, they were out pra practicing their dunks. 
instead of just it was just it was a it was a show mm -hmm. and it was not they definitely were fooling around they weren't focused and then uh, for anyone for any of the media that stayed around um, usually when they go to the press conference it's within 15 minutes of the game ending and um, this, after George Mason's uh, win the other day um, Derek Kellogg took over a half an hour to get to his press conference which means he was in the, the locker room really really getting down mm -hmm. on his team um, and I think that's what the, that's what they needed um, I, they needed to clear their minds they needed to get this idea of we're still a top 25 team out of that way because I think that became a distraction. So going into the, the George Washington game, they were really focused. And uh, for a team that had come into the game, had 19 wins, it was a must win. And uh, for a team as UMass that d has not played well on the road, it was also a good sign for them. Um, uh, a couple of players that really stepped up. I mean, everyone knows Chaz. Is, um, a lot of teams' strategy has been focused on Chaz. Mm -hmm. So a guy like Samson Carter, who had 20 points, including four for five from the three-point line, uh, which was a career best for him. And Derek Gordon, who's really stepped up in the last in the four out of his last five games, he scored in double digits. Um, so those two really helped lead the way um, in a game that really came down to the wire and was a must-win, and they were able to do the job. Yeah, huge game from Samson Carter. He was on fire that game. Yeah. That, that was fun to watch him shooting the ball. And Derek Gordon, you're right, he's... Lately, he's really been showing some of this potential we heard so much about when he yeah. transferred from Western mm -hmm. Kentucky. And he's a real bright spot for this team right now. It's, it's good to have him working it with Chaz. Absolutely. It's been fun to watch. Now, big game for UMass. One of their biggest games of the season. They'll be taking on VCU at the Mullen Center on Friday. It'll be on ESPN2, nationally televised. Everybody always loves that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a big game for them, especially going forward with the remainder of this season and also, as we always talk about, wanting to be a tourney team. VCU, yeah. a likely tourney team, Shaka Smart, popular coach, well-known names, teams like that tend to get in there. UMass needs to take down a team like this. So, Mark, I'll start with you. Close, Mark. Uh, why don't you give us a, a little idea of what you think the Minutemen need to do in order to beat VCU? Well, it's um, the VCU team that's going to be playing us on Friday night. It's going to be a battle of the guards. They have nine guards in their roster. Nine out of their 15 uh, players are guards. Um, and they're really going to have to. So if Charles and Derek Gordon, Trey Davis going to have to step up. They're going to have to play that guard game because that's what VCU depends on. But at the same time, because they have so many guards on the team, it means they don't have a lot of big guys, which means Caddy, Maxi Esho, Tyler Bergantino are really going to have to step up and have a big presence in the paint because they should be able to, there should be no reason for them not to with so many guards mm -hmm. on VCU's team. Um, two guys in particular that they're going to have to watch out for, uh, Trevion Graham, averaging just under 16 points per game. He's 6'6", six, six, but he plays the guard position. So, I mean, big boy. a big boy like that, he's, playing, he's not playing down low. So that's something that, that I think um, UMass is going to have to take advantage of. And uh, Melvin Johnson, averaging um, 10.5 points a game there forward. He's also a freshman now, which I think is going to play a lot, big, big role into uh, the way VCU uh, lines up this week. Um, they have a lot of young players on their team, and I think that's something that the UMass will be able to take advantage of. It's down to the end of the season. Um, I think their experience, the fact that we have three redshirt seniors on our team, where they have so many uh, young guys in their lineup, um, I think that experience is going to help UMass going forward. Um, and as you said, it's a big game for UMass. It's a sellout. Um, all the, it's going to be a big game, mm -hmm. um, they, and I think it's... That's the atmosphere that UMass plays the best in, and I think uh, it's going to be a good recipe for uh, what's to come mm -hmm. if they want to go into the tournament. Yeah, you say the guard being 6'6", six, six, you see Chaz going up against a guard 6'6", six, six, playing D on him. Stay low, go fast, go blow right by him. It's going to be an interesting matchup there. Like you said, we're a very guard-reliant team. Nine guards on their roster, another guard-reliant team. Probably going to see a very, very fast-paced game, exciting game. The type of basketball, really, that we've been seeing from the A-10, the entire A-10 Absolutely. lately turning into a powerhouse of a conference, and I will continue to claim that. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, actually, Mark, let's get your opinion first. What do you think the men need to do? Mark covered a lot here, so... Exactly, I was to about follow, to say, but... like, you're not going <laughs> to go with the commercial break without at least getting my two cents in here. <laughs> but yes, I mean, as I look at VCU coming into the Mullen Center on Friday, this is a team, at least as far as standings-wise goes, they are very similar to UMass as far as standings go. UMass, I believe, is 20-5. and five. 7-4 in the Atlantic 10, and VCU is 20-6. and six. I believe they're 8-3, and three, Correct, or 6, yes. yeah, 8-3 and three Correct, are, yeah. going to the Atlantic 10. And what I see from this VCU team is that they're actually first in the nation in steals. This will be a very different test than what UMass has seen 
so far this year. So yeah, ball protection is key in this game. If they want any chance to win, they need to hold on to that ball and keep VCU from stealing the ball. And like Mark over here said earlier, they need to watch out for Trevion Graham. He's one of the best guards in the Atlantic 10 Conference, just averaging under 16 points a game. And also their forward, um, Javante Reddick, he's shooting better than 50, 53% from the field. So yeah, he's going to be a force from the off, from, on the offensive floor. If UMass can shut down those two players, it gives them a chance to gives them a chance to hang around in this game. It's going to be an exciting A-10 battle at the Mullen Center. I'm sure student tickets are probably close to gone, if not gone already. They had just 3,000 to give out. Going to be a packed house. Going to be a very fun game, Mark. Thank you for that two cents. I almost left out, you know, but we need everyone's two cents around here. We're Thank all pretty you, broke college students. <laughs> mm -hmm. Guys, appreciate it. Next up, we have coverage of the beginning of the men's lacrosse season. But first, check out this interview. Our very own Adamo Pulzon got with James ahead of Good evening, Minute fans. I'm Adam Pulzon reporting from the Mullen Center where the UMass men's basketball team is taking on the George Mason Patriots tonight. And joining me to my left is UMass football alum, number 32 of the Baltimore Ravens, and Super Bowl champion, James the head of all. James, how's it going? Uh, it's going great, man. You know, thanks for having me. No problem. Now, not many people might know this, but you're actually from the Amherst area, is that correct? Yeah, man, I was born and raised in, Mass, in Amherst, Mass. Um, you know, definitely UMass alum. Grew up here, loved it, born and bred. Now, you played Amherst football in high school, correct? Yeah, definitely played and in Amherst football where, you know, there's very low recognition, but yet we were still state champs. Now, tell me about how that transition was, going from the high school level of football to the collegiate level, but in the same town. What was that like? Um, it was definitely, you know, a big-time transition because, you know, it, it, it's no different than you know, being, you know, big fish in a small pond in Amherst and then going to, you know, being a small fish in a big pond here at UMass and um, really transforming my game. You know, Coach Whipple, he gave me that opportunity to walk on and potentially earn my scholarship to, you know, um, prove myself that I was worthy of playing here at the university. And I, and I did that and, you know, went on to be an All-American and, and, and so forth. So he really gave me the opportunity and that, I was just really thankful for that. Now, I'm sure you've heard Mark Whipple is actually coming back to the UMass football program. Do you think he's going to ignite a fire under these players and maybe change the direction of this football team? Um, I think he already has. Um, you know, I think the change with him, you know, putting him at the helm was what this, you know, program needed. Um, you know, he, he's been successful on every level of his coaching career from, you know, being a world champion like myself with the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, being the offensive coordinator of the University of Miami, um, known, you know, the U, you know. So he, he's really proven that. He has recruiting ties all over. He's shown that, you know, even, you know, this year with a, a big-time recruit at tight end, which, you know, we beat out USC for, which is, which is big in itself. And, you know, transfers from Marshall and Penn State, um, really guys that can, you know, jump in right now and help this team get in the right direction. Now, when you played UMass football, you recorded 256 tackles and had 12 and a half sacks. But you were a walk-on recruit. And then you went on to become an undrafted player in the NFL. Now, many may consider you potentially an underdog, but obviously you're not. You're a Super Bowl champion. How did you overcome that stigma? Um, you know, I, I wore it, and I wore it with pride. Many called me an underdog, and, you know, often people, you know, tell me, hey, you're one of the most underrated safeties in the NFL. And, you know, it's kind of been my whole career, and I, and, and I appreciate that, and I wear it with pride, and I wear it with a chip on my shoulder because I always look at opportunities as the key to life. You know, you put an opportunity in front of me, you know, and I'll make the best of it and I'll maximize it. You know, often, you know, in my NFL career and even in college, you know, so many guys that I was around always said, man, if I got a chance, this is what I would do. And as they're saying that, their chance is passing them by. And so I just sat back, didn't say a word, went by the motto, outwork everybody, and, you know, just jumped at opportunities I had and made the best of it. Well, it definitely worked for you. I mean, you played alongside in the Super Bowl, Ray Lewis and Ed Reed, both potential, well, they are Hall of Famers. Tell me, how, what was that like? Um, definitely amazing. You know, I, I, I opportunity to play with Ed Reed, you know, the best at, you know, the position ever. And to learn from him, learn how he studied, how he went about, you know, his NFL to career to be so, so successful. And then, you know, Mufasa himself, you know, to be, you know, play alongside Ray Lewis. And, you know, his accolades go forever, but yet he's still humble and, you know, carries himself with such pride and, you um, and just an honor to be, you know, around him and learn from his leadership and the player that he is and such a dominant player he's been throughout his career. Now, let's take it back to that AFC Championship game. First off, are you were you a Patriots fan growing up? Um, 
Yes and no. I my dad was a Cowboys fan, so I really was a Cowboys fan. But I did, you know, um, enjoy the the old school UMass riots every time the Patriots won a Super Bowl. So um, was no, it I bittersweet when you guys it, defeated them in the AFC it, Championship game? It, it was awesome for me, only because only because you know I did a year there, and you know it didn't it just didn't work out. Um, you know, just wasn't a like minded situation for me, and so I went to you know Baltimore to be able to go back to. Um, you know, Gillette and win a game in the fashion that we did. Um, you know, it really wasn't awesome. And then to go on uh, and to be world champions and, you know, kind of, kind of solidified our place of greatness. Without a doubt. Now I'm going to ask you a few football questions if you don't uh, mind. Shoot, man, let's do it. Joe Flacco, elite? Why or why not? He's definitely elite um, despite this past year. You know, you could put it up with Eli, even though Eli has two Super Bowls, they both had off seasons. Um, you know, Joe's definitely elite because he proved it. Anytime someone offers you $100 million and you don't take it, but then you go out and throw eight touchdowns and zero interceptions in the playoffs and our Super Bowl MVP, that puts you as an elite quarterback. Now, this is going to be a little rough one, but do you hate Tom Brady as much as your teammate Terrell Suggs hates Tom Brady? I don't think anybody hates him as much as, as Sizzle does. Uh, Sizzle has, has a, a separate passion you know, for Tom. And, um, but, you know, I, I definitely I appreciate Tom as, you know, the man he is, on, you know, and his character and everything that he stands for. And, and it's definitely fun competing against him, I'd say that. Now, Ray Lewis said it was like playing a chess match against Tom Brady. Is that true? It's very so because, um, you know, Tom, he studies film. He's so aware of, you know, with him, he can look at the defensive line and know what the coverage is behind it because he studied it so much. So being able to show him one thing, make him think it's something, play something else, you know, it's back and forth. You know, it is a chess match. Now, can we see that Super Bowl rank? Can you show it up to the camera? Yeah, that's definitely, you know, it's a lot that's of hard legit. work right there. Yeah. One more football question before we go. we got to end it on a good note. Let's do it. Tim Tebow, you think he's going to play quarterback in the NFL again? Um, no, I think he's doing great with his T-Mobile commercials. No contract, baby. T-Mobile. All right. Well, you heard it first from Amherst Media. I'm Adamo Pozon with James Ahedabo signing off. Thanks for that, Adamo. Loved the interview. Hated the Tebow question. Now, getting back to this, men's lacrosse off to a beautiful start. Now joining me at the table to discuss some lacrosse, making his debut with us here, Cam Murphy and Jess Levinson. Guys, thanks for joining us. Now, Minutemen coming off a huge win, thrilling game, 12-11 against number 14 Ohio State in overtime. UMass starting off the season unranked this season, which uh, not too comfortable with. You know, we like to see them up there with numbers next to that name. But it's good to see them get a win like this to start the season off. Now, Cam, why don't you recap this game a little bit for us? Tell us uh, what happened. Yep, UMass continued their season with their second game this past Sunday against number nine, actually, Ohio State. Oh, did they fall to 14? Or that? Uh, they might have. I'm not up to check on That's that. That's my fault. That's my fault. Yeah, so 12-11 um, win overtime. Uh, freshman Nick Mariano scored four goals moving up to six goals on the season. Also, senior Matt Whippin with three goals, and Nick Mariano also had the overtime winning goal. And um, also, set, uh, sophomore Zach Olivery with 13 saves on the night. Great game, uh, I thought they played really well. Uh, transitions were good, attack were moving the ball, and uh, defense, they were very physical. And uh, Nick Olivery had some great saves, a couple uh, great saves in overtime too. So uh, I think they're really, I think they're looking good this year. Yeah, just a good all-around game from the team, offense, defense, goaltending. It's a good way you like to see them start the year. Big win like that, exciting games already. It's going to be an exciting season, and we will be covering it. Hopefully we'll see them back ranked soon. They continue to play like they did in that game. I'm sure we will be seeing that now. You mentioned Nick Mariano, freshman for the UMass lacrosse team. Huge, huge game for the team. Game in, goal in overtime to win the game and now we are ready to hype him up beyond belief based off one game. Now, Cam, I'll start with you because you gave us the recap. Do you think Mariano could be the next big thing for this lacrosse team? Something like a Will Manny, someone that goes out there and breaks school records? Uh, well, he's got six goals in the season, so um, he's off to a great start. Um, from the game, he had a couple, he's got some great shots. Um, I mean, Will Manny, he played like center attack and uh, Mariano's playing on the left side, but um, I think, yeah, if he keeps it up and hopefully he doesn't. Um, I know Will Manny fell injury on mm -hmm. his senior year, so hopefully he can stay strong and 
stay healthy, and I, I think he could in the end. I mean, so bar, barring injury, see yeah. some good things from but, him. Yeah, also it's his freshman year. I mean, he's still got a long way to go, and mm -hmm. by, the end, by his senior year, he could be a terrific player. Good things to see from the beginning, though. Good way to start off. A lot of potential. Young guy there. Jess, what do you think of Nick Mariano? you think he's going to be something special? Well, Nick Mariano's had an excellent start, as Cam said. Um, and I'm not sure if he'll continue that torrid pace this season, but he'll definitely get the opportunity to because mm -hmm. our top two scorers from last year, including Will Manny, graduated. So he's going to have to fill a void for a team that doesn't really score that many goals. But... Um, He's, he's going to be like a top line player and he takes the most shots on the team. And as Wayne Gretzky says, 100% of the shots you don't take don't go in. Beautiful, beautiful quote there, Justin. It is true, you know, you like to see offensive guys like that, especially in lacrosse because saves are hard to come by when you get good quality shots on net. So the more the better. And, you know, you get aggressive freshmen out there like that, who knows you can adapt into. And, you know, we're already giving him all this hype. We'll be keeping a close eye on him for sure and this team as the season continues. And as it does continue, they will be taking on Harvard at home at Garber Field, the 22nd. Always love the home games out there in the grass. Now, this is another big game for them. Harvard, quality lacrosse team. UMass trying to get the season off to a positive start, especially coming off a good win like this. Cam, what do you see going on in this Harvard game that they need to do to win? Uh, well, we beat them last year 8-6, uh, to six, and uh, they weren't, they were good last year, they, went, they had a 6-8 and eight record, but um, they're not ranked this year. They do have a junior goalie who last year only played two games, seven games a sophomore year, but only two games last year, so I think if they can come out, get some shots, um, just like come out guns blazing, mm -hmm. I think they could pull through. I mean, Man. they have they only already played two games, mm -hmm. Harvard has uh, UMass as their first game. So I think they're warmed up and they're ready to go. That's good. Got their legs under them already. Come out hot. Nick Mariano maybe get some shots on that early for us. But that is good to hear that. That is uh, Harvard's opening game. You know, some experience already for these guys getting out on the field. Harvard's going to be, you know, I'm sure they're practicing and everything. But game is a completely different, completely different area. So that'll be a, that'll be a good game for Minutemen. Hopefully see a bunch of goals scored there. Something to add to that is yeah. that... Um, Last year, UMass came out and won their first two games, but then they lost four out of their next five games. So uh, head coach is going to get on everyone to, to keep winning and not lose the pace that they have right now because they finished seven and eight last year, and the year before that, they were 15 and one. Mm -hmm. And so just two years ago, we were the best team, and I think we can get back to that if uh, they keep winning. So this third game, looking like a big hump in the road mm -hmm. for this UMass team, especially after like those stats you said from last year. Third game will be a big one. Hopefully we keep a little undefeated streak going. We'll be talking about some wins come next Tuesday. Guys, thanks for joining me. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll be right back with the Domo Pool Zone at the Sports Desk. Good evening, everyone. I'm Adamo Pool Zone, and this is your Boston Sports Desk. The NBA All-Star game this past weekend was a disappointment for those hoping to watch a good defensive game. The East came out on top over the West by a score of 163 to 155. East MVP Kyrie Irving closed the game in double-double fashion with 31 points and 14 assists. Now Sunday's game was missed by a few usual stars, most notably West All-Star Kobe Bryant, who was rehabbing a fractured knee he suffered earlier in the season. Now the All-Star game didn't have enough defense, but most notably this weekend, the NBA Slam Dunk Contest didn't have enough dunks. Social media was sent into a frenzy when the contest was abruptly ended after each participant only recorded one dunk each. There was no slam dunk champion. Instead, with the new format, there was a slam dunker of the night, which was won by Washington's Washington Wizards, John Wall. Now let's take it to the Olympics, where Team USA's hockey team has advanced to the quarterfinal game tomorrow night against the Czech Republic. The team earned their spot after defeating Slovenia Sunday by a score of 5-1. to one. Also, the team has named UMass alum Jonathan Quick as their starting goalie for the rest of the playoffs. Now let's take it to the Red Sox news, where Red Sox pitcher Ryan Dempster announced that he will not be joining the team this season. Many have wondered if the 36-year-old pitcher would retire, but he assures fans that he is not retiring, he's just taking a year off. Well, quick little segment today, but let's take it back to Casey Johnson in the newsroom. That was your Boston Sports Desk. Welcome back to UMass Sports Weekly. Now join me at the table to discuss some UMass hockey. JMS, Jesse Mayfield, Sheehan and Chris Potomatis. Guys, thanks for joining me. Good segment here, wrapping up the show. Good segment, bad stuff to talk about. <laughs> Tough weekend for the boys on the ice. Friday, 
lost to UMass Lowell 3-2. to two. Hate losing to our sister school, and I always say sister strongly. You know, <laughs> it was a good performance for the guys. 3-2, you know, that's, that, that's a good game. You, it's, it's hard to get out of team when they lose by one goal, scoring two goals. But it, it would have been nice to see him win. You know, I, you know, I would have liked to see him win. Uh, JMS, why don't you give us a little recap of the game, what you saw there. Casey, you talk about tough losses. It doesn't get much tougher than the loss that UMass had against UMass Lowell in this, um, you know, last Friday. They uh, were down two to nothing going into the third period. They scored two goals in the third period to make a comeback on UMass Lowell. Looks like they have a chance to finally get a win against UMass Lowell for the first time, you know, in a couple years because it's been quite a while since the UMass hockey team's been able to defeat the Riverhawks. And then with literally about a second or even less than a second left on the clock UMass Lowell is able to score a goal and get the game winner and you know when you lose in a heartbreaking fashion like that it just sort of adds insult to injury mm -hmm. on that one you know not, not just to lose to UMass Lowell not just to lose for I think the ninth time in a row but to lose at the last second of the game it's just like piling it on at that point. And it's like when people say hockey gods aren't real, you look at a game like that, how do you say hockey gods aren't real? It's unbelievable, you know. And just like you said, especially scoring two goals in the third, that's a really tough game to lose. Tying it up, scoring two in the third, and still losing in regular time. That's an impressive loss. I'll give yeah. them that. So it's a pretty impressive <laughs> loss, but also frustrating to watch. Chris, what would you see from these guys? I mean, I think it was good that they showed fight. You know, like you said, UMass Lowell is a team they always struggle against. Home, away, it doesn't matter. When they're playing UMass Lowell, they seem to struggle. And this UMass Lowell team, extremely good, number seven in the country. So you knew going in, you'd, you'd have your hands full on the road, and you get down 2 nothing after two periods. Most teams would pack it in, especially teams in the lower half of the hockey East standings. But UMass, they fought, they came back, they tied up 2-2. Philip Sherry, two of their top scorers, get it done. Two of the seniors carrying the team. And it really is heartbreaking to see a great effort loss on a, la on a, like, a last second goal. Mm -hmm. It's just tough to see that, cr you know, that puck cross the crease with you know, .1 or, mm -hmm. or whatever it was left. It's certainly a tough pill to swallow. And you know, I'm sure, that, I'm sure they, would, they would like to win, like to go into overtime, play a full five minutes to see, to see who's best. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, UMass Lowell was a little better. They got the puck you know, across, the, across the crease at the end of the game. And that was pretty much it. But, you know, I think you have to admire the fight in this team. They aren't going down quietly, and that's certainly a, a good quality to have. Yeah, yeah. But and a good note to add also, you mentioned Shiri scoring. His 100th career yeah. point with UMass. You know, tough to get it. A heartbreaking loss it is. there. But a big, you know, congratulations to Connor mm -hmm. Shiri. Certainly sure. a great feat to get his 100th career point with UMass. Yep, awesome. Awesome feat. Like you said, really tough to, because it's hard to celebrate when you get Absolutely. it in a game like that. But you, it, is, it is good to see. Great feat, great that he can take that with him after his senior year. And while we're staying on the pace of very tough losses, the very next night, <laughs> another one goal loss for the Minutemen to Northeastern, five to four. Another tough one to swallow, all the cliches we can use. We're getting pretty used to it right about now. And uh, it's tough to watch, but positive side for the show on this one is that JMS is actually there to cover it. So, JMS, why don't you talk a little bit about your highlight? All right. Well, like you said, a really exciting game to cover here. Tough loss, but let's take a look at what happened here. First period, bit of a give and go hit play here between Kevin Waugh and Mike Smatula. Ends with a goal for Waugh that puts the Huskies on the board here. They go up 1 0. All right. So, then, second period now, Adam Reed coming around the back of the net. He puts it in, and it's 2 0 Northeastern. But check out Steve Mastler's here at the end of the play, poking at Tanner Pond like that. Not what you expect from the UMass goalie, but no penalty given to him for that. So, now you take another look at the play. You see Reed's shot bounces off the skate of Oleg Yvenko and goes in. So, a bit of an assist for him there. Um, and now late in the second, UMass on the attack. The pass is deflected, but Ben Gallagher there, he defines it, knocks it in, puts UMass on the board, and gets his first goal as a minute man. So good stuff for him. But just two minutes later, Watt gets the puck away from Peter D'Angelo, goes on a two-man rush, finds Ryan Bellinger, and puts the Huskies back up by two. Then early in the third period, a shot by Zach Aston Reese is blocked, and in the ensuing mess, it's Pond who finds it and puts it in, and Northeastern goes up four to one. Then two minutes later, Aston Reese takes the puck away from Adam Phillips. He goes on a breakaway down the ice. He fakes out Mastlers and puts it in, and the Huskies go up five to one. And at this point, the game kind of seems out of reach for the Minutemen. 
you know, a bit of a tough deficit to overcome, but then just seconds after the next faceoff, Michael Pereira takes it away. He goes on a breakaway and he puts it in to cut the lead down to five to two. Then, just a minute later, it's another takeaway by Pereira. He goes on an odd man rush down the ice with Connor Sheary, and this time it's Sheary who puts it into the net, and the, sh the lead shrinks down to just two goals. So you take another look at the replay. You see Pereira goes for the backhand shot. It's blocked by the goalie this time, but Sheary is right there for the putback shot. So fast-paced game, but it's slow to a halt here as you, Northeastern's Matt Benning goes down with a knee injury, does not get up for a couple of minutes. And you see here how his knee collides awkwardly with Brandon Graysell. Um, Benning would have to be helped off the ice by his teammates. Really tough injury for him there. So then um, later in the third, the shot by Colin Shea tipped in by Zach LaRue. The junior gets his first goal of the season, and UMass comes within just one goal of the Huskies. And you see here LaRue fighting for position in front of the net. It's what you got to do when you're on the offensive. Here comes the shot. It's hard to tell who tips it in exactly, but LaRue did his job, and it led to the score. That's all that really matters. However, the Minutemen's last gasp in the final seconds comes up just short. They fall to the Huskies by the final score of 5-4. to four. Yep, so, like you said, a bit of a really just a tough, heartbreaking loss. Another near comeback for the Minutemen on that game. You know, following up that heartbreaker against UMass Lowell, you have another you know near comeback. But you know, one thing I do like seeing is this UMass offense. You know, like I said last week, you know, some more consistent, good production there. And what we're seeing with these past couple of games, some real fight in them here. Absolutely. They don't give up too late. You know, late in the game mm -hmm. when they're down, they fight back and. What I just really want to see from um, that, you know, what I, you know, they really need to do if they want to more consistently win is just more consistent defensive performance. Mm -hmm. I said it last week. I'll say it again. They need more consistent defensive performance. We're consistently saying it, and we're consistently <laughs> not seeing it. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, like you said, a lot of fight in, uh, in this team. Th those, are, those are quality losses, very quality <laughs> losses. Very you know, so. I, it's, a, it's a tough term. No loss is a good loss, but... I mean, this is a lot of positives to take from those 5-1 and coming back on a team like Northeastern. You know, they're really showing something there, but still comes up on a loss on the board. JMS, beautiful stuff there. Chris, what else did you see in this heart? Another heartbreak. Just two oh, heartbreaking games. Heart can't take yeah, it anymore. Yeah, two points I have to take away from. One is on the highlight shot, two goals were on, were on UMass turnovers, where, where Northeastern was able to go in transition, get, you know, get you know, the odd man rush and put the puck in the net. And I mean, I don't care who you have in goal. If you're constantly seeing odd man rushes, you're bound to go up a few. This is Hockey East, there's great players, a lot of, you know, future NHLers out there. So I think you have to cut the turnovers down, and that's one thing. The second thing is, it seems like all year we're talking about the same players always going for UMass, Phillips, Sherry, Pereira, Graysell. And, you know, in, in this game, you saw two guys get their first goals of the year, LaRue yeah. and Gallagher, so it was cool to see Two guys who have been scoring step up when this team needs it the most. And again, 5-1, you're down. You just lost a heartbreaker last night. Northeastern was 12 in the country. Again, another game where UMass could have packed it and, and you probably just could have said, all right, you know what, they shouldn't have tonight. On to, on to next weekend. You know, it just wasn't our night. But this team fights back. They tied it up and they have an offensive zone faceoff in the final seconds. They can't convert. But you have to love the heart of this team. You know, the talent may not be where – it's out with other teams, but they try to make up for it in hard, and more times than not, they make it a very competitive game. We saw a few weeks ago when, when they tied up against uh, BU, they were down 3-1 in the third, come back to tie that one up, so this team has a lot of fight in them. They, they, they won't go down easy, they won't quit, and that's certainly good quality. I don't know if that's the coaches, the players, a combination of both, but it's certainly a bright spot for this team. One bad thing I think to look at was Steve Massler's in goal saw 21 shots and gave up five goals. Some of them odd man rushes. You have to just chalk that up to bad defense. It's not all the goaltender. But, you know, you, you'd like to see a little better save percentage than that going forward. Again, one bad game, not going to crucify him. He's been very good all year. But I think that's one thing to stand out is he's been your rock all year in net. To have an off game when, you know, when you're not a great team, your goalie has an off game, it's really hard to win games like that. Yeah, tough game. But, uh, like you said, just some positives to take from it. For sure. But they just need to get over that hump. Yep. to get to the win Absolutely. you know you can you can come back as much as you want but if you're losing games nothing good's going to yeah. come of it you need they need to just get that victory or like jms has been saying we need to see some consistency where it's not about coming back anymore Absolutely. it's yeah. about holding the lead and maintaining with defense yeah. but we'll hopefully see that from them this upcoming weekend as the minutemen take on providence another hockey east powerhouse going to be another tough two games 
for the boys. Saturday night, if I'm not mistaken, is senior night. So lots to look forward here in this weekend. JMS, why don't you give us a preview? What do they have to do to see some success and not just be coming from behind in these games? Well, you know, Casey, I think this could be, you know, pretty winnable game. You know, Providence is a higher up team in the Hockey East ranked team, just like, you know, UMass's past two opponents. But, you know, they have shown in these past couple of games against UMass Lowell and Northeastern that they can compete with some of the ranked teams mm -hmm. um, in the NCAA and some of the higher t up teams in the Hockey East. Providence not as high up um, right now as UMass Lowell and Northeastern in the Hockey East standings. And they've been going in, in a bit of a slump lately. Four, they've lost four of their past five games. That fifth game was a tie. And they've been shut out in two of those five games. Haven't even scored th uh, as much as three goals in those past five games. So they've been in a serious, serious slump in these, uh, you know, over a bit of a stretch. So I think if UMass can take advantage of that, you know, and really step up and take advantage of how, you know, Providence has been doing of late, and I think they could um, really, you know, turn the next couple of games, you know, into some potential points um, on the standings. And I think, you know, it's the seniors are going to definitely have some real energy going mm, into this. Absolutely. It's going to be very emotional, which could be hard to overcome. But I think they'll definitely want to go out with a bang um, at the end of their regular season. You know, a lot of strong players on that are going to be, you know, very emotional on this. You know, mm -hmm. got a lot of seniors, you know, on this team right now. Um, Graysell, Pereira, Sheary, um, Phillips, Conchay, Joel Hanley, plenty of strong seniors on this team that are going to be, you know, just playing through a lot of emotions, but also playing with a lot of energy, you know, kind of balances off, I think, a little bit. So it's going to definitely make, I'll say this, it'll be a very entertaining game to watch. Yep. And, you know, probably going to be a great ceremony afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be very exciting to see some great play. And like you said, it seems like we're catching Providence at a very good time in the season as they are really struggling right now, while UMass, even though coming off two losses, playing some good hockey. So I'm sure we'll see some great hockey this weekend. Chris, what do you think they need to do to win these games? Well, I think one thing that we've been saying all season is tighten up their defense. Mm -hmm. You know, don't allow odd man rushes, you know, get in front of that. It seems like I, even sometimes it's just a matter of UMass not clearing guys out of, uh, you know, in front of the goalie. It seems like guys getting second and third chances, you have to clear guys out of there when you're in your own defensive zone. The good thing about these home and home series, which we have, is that usually they're split, you know, one loss, one, you know, one win. Very rarely do you see one team take both games. So I think UMass will definitely come, come away with points this weekend, especially with senior night. You know, we talk about this senior heavy team. Hopefully some of those better players will, you know, feel, you know, a little more, a little more effort, you know, a little more um, out there to mm -hmm. really score. You know, we see Sherry Pereira, two of the best players on the team, both 100 point scorers here at UMass. So hopefully they come out with fired. Hopefully, you know, the underclassmen want to fight for their seniors, want to send them out on a, on a high note. And it's impossible for them to get, uh, you know, to, to go up a little bit in the hockey standings too. So there are points out there to, to fight for. It's not just like no matter what, they're going on the road first round. So it should be entertaining. It should be fun. It's a last ride for a lot of these seniors when and there's nine of them. So certainly a lot have a lot to play for. Providence, like you said, struggling offensively. So certainly if there's ever a time to play them, it's right now. And, you know, this UMass team, they have a lot of fight. You know, we've seen that before. So it should be an entertaining hockey. It should go down to the third period, both games, and be fun to watch. Yeah, it looks like Friday is really going to be the big game for yes. UMass. Because if they can come out of that game with a win, go into senior night. Eight points quickly. Good, good chance yeah. of a two-game sweep there. Absolutely. You know, you can't win the first game. You can't win both games. So that's going to that's gonna be the big one there. You want to see good good performance from them there, especially even if it is a loss, you don't want to see a bad loss. Because going into senior night facing the same that's team, tough off a bad loss would be really tough but we got some high hopes here for the Minutemen against Providence you see you think what do you think one and one or you think two and oh Minutemen well it's tough to say but um if I had to accurately guess I'd say one and one one and one yeah probably but if, take but if you're guessing with your heart oh. <laughs> two and oh I'm a journalist two I have and to oh, say. Oh, right, there we go he's saying professional no you know what? I, I can respect it well guys appreciate it great stuff there thanks for joining me and thank you at home for watching. As always, make sure to check us out on Facebook, like us, UMass Sports Weekly. Also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at UM Sports Weekly, where we have all your coverage of UMass basketball and all the other sports. You're number one for that coverage. And as always, we will be back here next week, same time, same place.